So take my hand now and follow me down this rabbit hole. It's going to take us to some dark and horrifying places, but there are lessons to be learned along the way. And we begin in the present day with a journalist who now goes by the name Gabrielle Mack and identifies as a man, though she is a biological female. Gabrielle is uh, featured on the cover of the latest issue of New York Magazine in a story which she penned herself titled, My Penis, Myself. I didn't need a penis to be a man, we're told on the cover, but I needed one to be myself. Now, the article goes into graphic, gory detail about Gabri uh, Gabrielle's quest to surgically masculinize herself in order to vaguely approximate the appearance of a biological male. I'll, I'll read only as much of the piece as is needed to get the point across. Uh, I will tell you that the first line is this. On the day that I heard my penis would be huge, I sobbed. That's the first line. Yes, I mean, what man cannot relate to that experience? You know, you're actually a man if you select your penis out of a catalog rather than simply, you know, being born with one. The article goes from there and it gets more bizarre and certainly a lot more nauseating. Here's a, a few morsels and I'm kind of choosing bits somewhat at random, but, um, but here they are. Uh, at one point she says, I could not have gotten my boobs cut off fast enough. And I spent weeks before my 2019 hysterectomy up late in bed, hot and sleepless, fantasizing about the moment the medical waste disposal team at UC San Francisco would batch incinerate my uterus, which swirled with dysphoria like nausea from the depths of my soul. But just as you might feel an automatic no if a doctor offered to cut one of your healthy arms off for you, when I thought about cauterizing, excising, and sewing closed my vagina, my whole body cringed. Wrong. Well, yeah, that, that is certainly wrong. At another point, we're told, the whole process is constant body horror, Barian, a nurse, said at one point, after he told me that the penis tip discoloration I was worried about might just be tissue that's dying off, which is also fine. And this was a recovery with no complications that required surgery. The overall proportion of fallow, phalloplasties, that's uh, the, the, what they call the surgery where they make a fake penis, that needs surgical revision, while lower for some surgeons, including mine, is about one in two. The highest number of corrective follow-up surgeries, surgeries needed by anyone I know personally is 12. So did you get that? One in two of these surgeries has to be corrected. And there are people who have 12 corrective surgeries. Well, that's totally normal, right? 12 corrective surgeries? She also talks about the controversy over this procedure, even within the trans community. Um, she says, phalloplasty in general, it was clear, it was hard for people to accept. Well, I will love you no matter what, sweetie, a cis female best friend of mine said when I told her I was transitioning years before. Quote, as long as you don't get a d One flatly demanded, don't get a d It was another trans masculine person I used to know said, disgusting, insane to want, and to have a surgeon make a, a, a sensate phallus out of your arm or leg or somewhere and Franken stitch it to your body to go so far out of your way to opt into a tool, perhaps the tool of so much suffering, is wrong, she said. Most trans masculine people didn't get one. The seminal print trans mask magazine was named after not getting one. It's called Original Plumbing. I saw trans masculine support groups shut down and go silent more than once when someone brought up the procedure. And later, when I was that someone, I was twice invited to leave with other people who might want to talk about that. Now, so she doesn't hide from the fact that uh, this procedure is dangerous, where they make a fake penis and they stitch it to your body. In fact, the procedure kills people. But that also seems to be a potential perk from her perspective. She says, it has happened at least once that someone did die from the procedure. I was fully ready to, by which I mean I just spent nearly the last of my savings, which I'd burn navigating the uh, social, medical, legal, extreme, mind, F show of transitioning on a burial plot just in case. So she bought herself a burial plot before the procedure. Again, totally normal. One of the nodding heads in the group belonged to a non-binary white person who was still horizontal in recovery from having had a week prior the worst happen, which was that after their procedure, in which all the fat and skin had been stripped from their left forearm from wrist to nearly elbow, along with major nerves and artery and veins, and then shaped into a tube and connected in careful layers to skin and blood vessels and nerves in their pelvis, their new penis had failed. It died on them. But here they were, already getting ready for their surgeons to harvest a whole other part of their body within a month with zero hesitation. 
Because those three, day, those three days they'd had their penis, they said, before being rushed into an eight-hour surgery that couldn't save it, the feeling of it, even just for one moment, even still bloody and painful and packed with stitches, made it all worth it. Now, if this all sounds totally insane, um, then get a load of this line. She says, but when penis is self, as penis is a gift to self, it's a gift too to others. Hmm. My penis is a gift to others, she says. There's a, an interesting pickup line, I guess you could try. And yet penis is self is the more revealing phrase here because she sees the self as being contained within a sex organ. Penis is self. That might be, if I, if I had to pick any three words to sum up the leftist ideology, it might be that. Your self is contained by your sex organs, or in this case, an artificial sex organ. A sex organ constructed from flesh hacked off of your own body. Now, this is probably a good time to show you the picture if you haven't seen this, uh, if there could possibly be a good time for that. Here's the cover of the magazine um, with uh, Gabrielle Mack, and, and you see uh, her in her underwear with a, a huge hole dug out of her thigh there. You can see that in the, in the thigh. But you also notice something else, the sad thing here. If we can select just one sad thing from this tragic, grotesque spectacle, and, and that is that she still doesn't look at all like a man. Right? She has wide hips, kind of an hourglass figure. Um, she's very small and petite. Now, she doesn't look like a woman, certainly, but neither does she look like a man. She's in sort of a gender purgatory. What, what we find is, is that we can reject the gift of our own physical selves by mutilating our bodies. But what we cannot do is create a new self. You know, when it comes to ourselves... We have only the power to maintain or destroy, not to create. If you, to, if you choose to destroy yourself, you'll be left with this. Which is what all trans people who get surgeries are left with. You're left living in a prison of your own making. Stuck like that forever. But I told you this story gets darker. Um, and it does. Gabrielle Mack has extensive experience doing violence to herself. In fact, back in 2011, when she was still a journalist named Mack McClelland and uh, still identified as a, a woman, she wrote an article for Good Magazine where she describes staging her own violent rape. Now, McClelland wrote at the time that she met a woman in Haiti when she was in Haiti. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think she was working for Mother Jones and she was as a journalist in Haiti stationed there. And um, a year prior to this, so 2010, she was in Haiti, and uh, she met a, a woman who had been gang-raped by a group of men. Now, this experience, meeting this woman, supposedly caused trauma for her, for McClelland. She was the one who had the trauma. And after talking it over with her therapist, as she explains in this article she wrote, the two decided that the best way to overcome this trauma would be to stage her own rape. And so she enlisted a helpful friend to have violent sex with her while suffocating and beating her. And, uh, and she went through with it, and she says the experience was cathartic and healing. Now, what this tells us, first and foremost, is that McClelland is a deeply disturbed, mentally ill person. And we would have known that even without her background of therapeutically raping herself. But that detail drives the point home, I think. But then again, I think, I think mentally ill is kind of too broad a category to be useful here. More specifically, we should say that, that, that McClelland suffers from a very potent and very toxic mix of psychotic narcissism and self-loathing. And those two things not only can go hand in hand, but almost always do. She's a narcissist because she's totally obsessed with herself. She can't think about anything but herself. That's all she thinks about. It's all she writes about. A woman in Haiti was gang raped. And somehow that became a story about her and her own trauma. She fetishized someone else's rape and then wrote about it proudly in a magazine. This is such a perfectly narcissistic move that it ought to be included as an example of the word in the dictionary. But she also hates herself. That's why she wanted to be beaten and brutalized. She's turned on by the idea of someone abusing her because she despises her, herself. She says that the fake rape was a successful form of therapy, and, uh, and she was healed from the experience, not surprisingly, 
That turns out to be untrue. Because she spiraled from there, spinning around in circles of self-loathing and narcissism until she committed the ultimate act of self-hating narcissism by mutilating her body and attempting to construct a brand new self out of the pieces. You know, constructing a self out of the pieces of the old self, like her body was nothing but a box of Legos or a potato head doll. She sees the self not as a complete and coherent thing, but as fragmentary. A collection of arbitrary parts, each meaningless in its own right, adding up to a whole, which is also meaningless. Of course, there's a very serious logical problem with all of this. Well, I mean, many logical problems, but here's one. We're told that gender is meaningless anyway. We're told that penises have nothing at all to do with manhood. We're told that a penis is, is only arbitrarily associated with being a man. It has no actual bearing on the matter. So what's the point? of the operation. Isn't getting a penis in that case like getting a beak or feathers or having a th three additional fingers attached to your left hand? It's a totally random and unnecessary bodily addition which has no inherent meaning whatsoever. That's what gender theory tells us. And yet gender theory also propels women to chop off their breasts and have fake penises attached to their crotches in an effort to be men. It's totally confused. And that's by design. Can any thinking human look at this disturbed person and listen to her story and conclude that sex change surgery is what she needed? Should it not be clear that her sickness is in the mind, not the body? Isn't that obvious for everyone who seeks out these kinds of procedures? It is, of course, but the argument starts to feel futile when you realize that the people pushing this kind of Frankenstein butchery aren't making any sincere attempt to help the mentally afflicted people who seek it out. They aren't worried about the logical problems, much less the moral problems. It is, in the end, all about destruction. So when I sit here and say, this is destruction, what they say is, well, yeah, thanks for noticing. Destruction of the so-called gender binary. Destruction of truth, of science. Destruction of beauty. Destruction of society, of civilization. And it all begins at the most fundamental level with the destruction of the self, which is what we have here. Well, I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Matt Wall Show. If you did, go ahead and hit that subscribe button right down there so you can stay up to date on all of our future content.